This episode of the podcast is supported by Bentley Lewis, an award-winning executive search firm. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. We are proud to be official media partners of Dive In Festival 2019 this year, which is really cool. And we're doing a series of podcasts for the festival. And if you don't know, uh, Dive In Festival is a global movement in the insurance sector, which is supporting the development of inclusive workplace cultures. So really, really cool work. They're in their fifth year. They're in about 33 countries now. So they do these really cool um, events, panel discussions uh, all over the world, really helping to promote diversity and inclusion, which is very cool. Today, I had a great conversation with a guy called Matt Allison, who is a really interesting, thought-provoking transgender speaker. And he's speaking at Dive In Festival next week. And he came in and he spoke about his life experience, the journey he's gone on uh, as he's transitioned from female to male and all of the things that went with that so very very interesting and we discussed some very controversial topics around uh, the age someone should can transition the sporting debate you know whether particularly trans females should and be able to compete in female sporting events we talk about hormone blockers and all of that stuff so really interesting and hope you enjoy it hey it's lewis welcome to the podcast enjoy our conversations anytime anywhere Matt, thanks for coming in. No, thank you for having me. No pleasure. I know it was a bit of a mission on the train. And yes. <laughs> but you made it. Yes. So, yeah, what is your story? I was born physically female, so I'm transgender. Physically female, psychologically male. That's yeah. really important. And I've basically transitioned medically so that my body now aligns with my psych. And what age did you kind of realise or start thinking about it? That's a, that's a really interesting question. I think most people kind of ask, okay, so if you were born female, at what point did you realise you wanted to be male? But it wasn't that way around, it was the other way around. So my first instincts of anything gender coming in, probably, I don't know, three or four, um, was me discovering that I couldn't have the toys I wanted to play with, I couldn't wear the clothes I wanted to wear. So it was actually me discovering that I'm not a boy. But what, so so you, your parents weren't letting you play yeah. with like classic... Yeah. yeah male toys I asked for an action man over and over again I never got one (laughs) really (laughs) yes interesting I think nowadays it feels like parents are trying to be gender neutral aren't they and let their kids play with like footballs and toys whatever Barbie Mm -hmm. dolls yeah but I think yeah back when we were growing up yeah I was born in 74, so yeah, it was very different back then, yeah. Interesting. And mm. so you were trying to get these toys, but just not being able yeah. to... Yeah, and all my friends, preschool anyway, were boys. That's just who I kind of like connected with. And then starting school was more difficult because I don't know why at that point, where obviously back then, nowadays girls can wear trousers to school. Yeah. But no, my school uniform, I had to wear a skirt. From from early age? Yeah. From like yeah. five or... Yeah, yeah, five, yeah. So was it, a, was it a mixed school? Or? Yes, yeah. yeah. My senior school was girls only I don't want to out myself to certain people and if they ask what school I went to it's quite awkward how interesting so you you felt really that you were male Mm -hmm. throughout school but and then she started the secondary school which was an all-girls school yeah and how did you find that experience um I'm glad I went to that school to be honest uh in terms of my education but I didn't feel obviously like I fitted in I just I went I feel my sister went there and so my parents showed me and said, you know, do you want to go here? So I kind of just went, yeah, okay. And I didn't really think about it. I was too young. I was 10, 11. Yeah, yeah. So it just happened. And then and then you started then to just realise more over, over time? Um, I wouldn't say more because I just always knew. Right. In fact, um, going back, one of the things that happened, and this wasn't my earliest memory, but I was five years old when I said something to my family and they, the reaction that I got, I just knew, even at the age of five, that this was odd, this was weird, and I just shut up about it. Right. I just thought, no, this, is, this isn't right. So literally, from the age of five, it was something I thought would happen on my sixth birthday, that's how I remember very clearly when it was, and that was it. I, I swore at that point that I was gonna take this big, dark secret to my grave and never act on it, never do anything. Crazy. Yeah. And then, and so when, when were you able to then start to speak about it, or what's the kind of process around Um, Well, I didn't tell anyone. And then my partner, who I met when I was 30, um, male partner, uh, he guessed what was going on with me, which, you know, I dressed very androgynously in jeans and a T-shirt all the time. And I lived as a tomboy. 
So it, it baffles me sometimes how other people didn't twig what was actually happening. Yeah, yeah. But um, he just asked me outright. And from then it meant I had uh, someone to confide in. That helped with formal events when I didn't know what clothes to wear because I had someone to try and help me and yeah. that actually understood what the problem was. Um, and it, he spent 10 years telling me people won't care. He said, obviously they will care, but not in that way. And I didn't really believe it, still didn't feel confident. And then basically what happened after years of struggling and finding it really difficult but obviously that was my life I didn't know any different so that was just how I lived yeah um I started looking on YouTube and obviously when I was younger there wasn't any internet so I didn't know what was possible and what hormones so, so looking at YouTube is the process to transition um it it can start it for some people because it gives information yeah, yeah. um yeah. so at that point I then started seeing female to male transgender people transitioning and documenting their journey and seeing them flourish in all the ways that I wanted to and growing facial hair, voice breaking, getting muscles, having yeah. a surgery and just this yearning to do this was getting stronger and stronger. I spent probably about a year coming home from work and watching these videos and it just got, it went on and on and it the impulse just got stronger and stronger yeah, yeah. until eventually my idea was actually okay I'm going to go and speak to someone but and how old were you at the time? I was 30. 39 39 yeah. at the time so okay so you went from so that nine years of so, so you met your partner at 30, 30 yeah. yeah and then kind of getting into it and learning and um well I was probably learning before then I can't remember whatever time yeah, yeah. you know I started looking on the internet but it would come and go. Yeah. Sometimes I'd walk away from it. It's a bit like Pandora's box. If you don't think about it, uh, okay. it doesn't hurt as much. And then you then go through, through phases where you start looking and getting excited at what's possible. But I'd already put my barriers up. I decided I wasn't going to do it. So all that did was make it really painful for me. Right, right. To actually realise what was possible and realise that it wasn't for me. So after about a year of just, it got to the point where I felt like I need help of some sort. So I sought out a counsellor that was gender specific and went and spoke to him and I thought basically my ideas were to try and find I had many many coping mechanisms that would help me cope with being in the wrong identity and I was hoping for more of those but there was a little bit inside me that kind of thought well maybe he can unlock something and you know say something that gives me permission to transition yeah and obviously yeah. I knew that only I could make that decision and I can't let somebody else you know, somebody else can't do that for me but there was a list just a small part of me thinking maybe he can do that for me yeah and you know what he did nice. so in that first session my barriers were just broken down and yeah they they talk in um counseling terms because I've done some counseling training since about the therapeutic moment and I still remember that moment really clearly that that little thing that just made the journey that I then took easy. So what's the therapeutic moment? So it's when um, it's, it's like the kind of aha kind yeah, of moment where it's, it's like... It's when you get that little bit of information that actually just shifts how you think and allows you to make the changes or see things clearer or whatever it is you're needing from that, yeah. that situation. Brilliant, brilliant. And so, the, and so then it, it went from there? Yeah. And so how, how long then from, from your, your moment with your psychologist yeah. to you actually thought, right, I'm on? Um, well, I saw him in July and yeah. I ha this was 2013. Right. I had a few more questions that I wanted answering, such as what are the health implications of taking hormones? And I had those questions answered in September and I'd already started the process of seeing obviously seeing a counsellor which is part of like the hoops you need to jump through okay. I'd seen a specialist so I could ask you know, a doctor so I could ask my questions privately and um, so I was lucky that from that September I made my mind up I got my questions answered at a session I went to at a support group and I changed my name by depot the following day and I started hormones the next month oh, wow so it's quite quick that was very quick yeah. because obviously I don't know people listening might not realise but some of the gender clinics especially now the waiting lists are getting longer and longer and they're usually at least a year I think some of them are two or three years before you even get an initial appointment. Wow. So just for those that don't know, what, what's the process? So obviously stage one is you've gone to see a psychologist. Then what's the process from there? Um, well, if you're, if you're doing using the NHS, you go and see a GP and your GP should refer you straight away to a, a gender identity clinic. Right. Because obviously they're the specialists. Um, it's changed from many years ago when you used to have to go see a psychiatrist separately because obviously they're not gender specialists. So you shouldn't delay in getting you to, to the correct sort of help. So then you go to your GIC, which is the Gender Identity Clinic, and there you see either counsellors or doctors, um, psychiatrists maybe, depends who's, which clinic you go to and how they operate. You have to jump through certain hoops, have certain appointments, and then once you get the go-ahead and they're happy that you're ready, yeah. they 
everyone takes a different route as well. So for most people, hormones are the most important part, and then surgery. But yeah. not everyone wants hormones. Not everyone wants surgery, and there's different options. Ah, okay. And there's no right or wrong. Oh right. So, so you'll get some advice. Yeah. And then you'll decide on on the best yeah. thing for you. Yeah. Yeah. So informed consent, really. Yeah. yeah. And then much like GP practices is long sounds like there's a long waiting list. <laughs> yes, a very long waiting list, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So is this a mixture of obviously more people and coming into the country and stuff, but also it being more accepted now and it being more yeah. public and open and Yeah. I think definitely because like I said, when I was younger, it was very different. Whereas now, having seen, you know, one of the things that I, I noticed when I was watching the YouTube clips was the amount of trans people transitioning and saying, my family and friends have been amazing. So there, you know, I know so many people that have lost family and friends, but then also many are just saying that it's fine, they've had no problem. And obviously the scary thing is, you think, oh, it's all right for them, but it won't be like that for me. It's going to go wrong. It, you, know, you always think worst case yeah, scenario. Yeah, yeah no matter how good it looks for other people. But actually it was fine. I just had 100% support from everyone I told. And I think, why did I wait 39 years? But yeah, so things are different nowadays. And because of that, and there's much more, this is where as well, the, the work that the Diving Festival are doing. Yeah. It's just amazing in just raising awareness, which is allowing people to transition and feel safe and secure definitely in, in decisions to do that and so um how did you get into diving but then i guess maybe more more broadly how has this experience governed what you've decided to do with your life and yeah work wise and so forth well i'm so i've been matt six years now and i still feel like i'm changing and although i'm, I'm physically kind of where i want to be life is changing i've got so much more confidence just because i'm myself which is amazing to experience and I'm trying to do more speaking gigs so that I can educate people and help people, which I enjoy. I've always enjoyed doing things like that. Yeah. So you get um, you get on stage and yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's a crazy um, thing from like deciding um, to transition to then coming out to your family and friends yeah. and stuff to then being like coming out to the whole world. And yes. Yeah. How did that happen? Was that like a like a conscious decision, or were you always um, just drawn to? No, I wasn't always. I, I'm actually kind of, which some a lot of trans people are, semi-stealth. So if it's stealth, that means the people around you don't know. And a lot of the people around me don't know that I've transitioned. And oh, yet right. I'll stand in on a stage in front of a group of strangers and talk completely openly about it. Um, so the process there, as so I've always liked speaking, I, I look back and thought when I was at school, if someone had come in and spoken to the school about this, it could have changed my life. It literally could have made, I might have transitioned sooner if I'd had that information. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I could do that for other people. And I, I actually teach guitar as well. And one of the things I love about that is the difference I can make for people. And so to, to make a difference in terms of transition and moving transgender rights forward excites me. Yeah. And um, so initially it was just literally, I thought, oh, I can do some good here. And then I actually have a very good friend of mine who's an international speaker, very sought after. And I mentioned it to him just thinking, well, maybe he can get me on a stage and I can do some good. Yeah. And he kind of bit my hand off because he said, you've got all the skills you need. You've got, you know, something to say. You like standing in front of um, people. You've got communication skills. And it just, it planted a seed in my head that actually I could do what I love and help people for a living. That's where that, that came from. Awesome. Yeah. And how long have you done that for the last six years? Um, no, no, I I started six years ago yeah. and didn't really get anywhere because it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. And I realised that my, my idea of standing in, on a stage in schools <laughs> was possibly outdated because obviously things have moved forward yeah, and yeah. most school kids know. In fact, <laughs> right. when I... Um, so no one turned up at school? Yeah. <laughs> like standing. When, when, well, when I transitioned with my business at, at, at guitar school, yeah. I had to tell every single student or if they're under 18, the parents. And I literally thought some people, you know, statistically, when I had to tell, you know, 50 to 100 people, someone's not gonna like this, yeah. I'm gonna lose some clients. Not one of them did. And in fact, what was really interesting was that many of the parents came back, they, you know, all they want is a guitar lesson for little Johnny who's eight years old. Yeah. And they've now gotta go home and have a really difficult conversation about the guitar teacher. <laughs> And yeah, they came back, they all did it. They came back and many of them just said, you know, oh yeah, they just went, oh yeah, we've done that at school, mum, and carried on doing what they were doing. So oh, wow. you know, it's amazing what- So done it at school as in they've been educated it. about it? Yeah. Ah. yeah. So it's in the curriculum now? Um, I don't know, um, there's recent things in the news, isn't there? Yeah, there's you see things. I'm complaints. never sure quite what um, yeah. 
but it obviously is being covered because that was what was feeding back to me yeah, yeah. so the parents Brilliant. were okay and they were a bit mm, okay we'll do this yeah. but the response I then got was just oh yeah it's fine you know the kids just they yeah, knew yeah. about it amazing so that's and what, just on moving on to age then what, what are the what are the issues around age because been that's been a lot in the news very yeah. controversial um, you know the age someone can transition it'd be useful to find out currently what the, the law is I guess in this country and, mm. and what you think about the different yeah. issues and stuff it's really controversial um, and I ha- being trans myself obviously and knowing how deep rooted it is it's not something that develops or grows you're born like that and if you are born like that you just know but obviously there are cases where people you know it's natural that people you get cross-gender play and that's just a phase cross-gender play being like so a boy might decide that they they, they like to be a girl or they like to act more girly or play with girls yeah yeah. clothes or vice versa boys and girls and that's quite natural normal and it can just be a passing phase but it's very it's just something on the surface if you're trans there was one incident i was speaking because i've done um stuff like i co-chaired the FTM London support group which is FTM the, is um, female to male okay so um, for a couple of years yeah. so I'm sort of involved in the community and I actually was chatting online to the mum of a trans girl so someone that was born physically male but psychologically female just going through puberty voice just starting to break trying to get her on blockers and, she and this said, is and she was how old um, I can't remember 12, 13 maybe yeah. and the mum was being brilliant very on side understood and just said I didn't I didn't meet the, the trans girl but I met right. the mum and she said that her daughter was look, was really looking forward to starting blockers and experiencing hot flushes and she said because that's what Nan has isn't it because it was a female thing yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. that's just one example there's yeah you, know, you could write a whole massive book on all the things that affect when you when you're trans yeah, yeah. that it's not just a passing phase there's things that are so deep rooted that that it just wouldn't be happening if that was a phase yeah and yeah. obviously people looking on the outside think but you're too young to, to make those decisions but the people that are trained you know you have to jump through all these hoops but i'm hoping in the future that won't be the case because the specialist diagnoses you in one visit you know if you if you're trained in this you can tell whether someone is so in an hour gender. meeting and you can yeah 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 so you're normally diagnosed in your first session right when you know all this why wait why make someone yeah, you know, it's really distressing. Transition is um is the amazing experience you can ever experience. It's brilliant. Um, it's very, very treatable. And so why make someone go through the wrong puberty, become really distressed, possibly have mental health issues, you get a lot of self harm and suicide within the transgender community. And um it all could be prevented if you could just go through the right puberty at the right time. So what do you think is the right time? I think it's at puberty. At pub- which is different for different people. Yes, yeah. And what but, is the law at the moment? Um, I'm not actually 100% sure. Is it 18 Be- or 16? I know or? that some people have transitioned 16. And I In know the that UK, some people yeah. have been given hormones younger than that as well. Ah, uh, okay. And there's always a big outrage when that happens. So but, is there no real current like law? Like I don't I don't think so. I think yeah. there's guidelines. You've got the right. WPATH. Um, which is the world E I can't actually remember what that stands for but you've got the W path guidelines W path yeah, yeah I'll put that in the, we'll, we'll put that in the uh, in the show notes so yeah, if people yeah, want to look yeah. they can click on it yeah. Um, yeah. which is it's, it's like a worldwide organization and they yeah. they give guidelines but they are only guidelines there's there's different trains of thought and there's obviously there's it, nothing can be perfect yeah but you've got blockers so you can give a child blockers when they start puberty and then women tend to start puberty earlier yes. than guys start puberty. Yeah, which yeah. can be problematic with that. Which, and yeah, yeah. say there's pros and cons. But what they do, I mean, there's lots of there's lots of problems with going through the wrong puberty, and there's irreversible changes that happen. And if you have blockers, then you just put your puberty on hold. And what that enables you to do is it gives you time so that you can go through assessments and wait till you're till the world decides that you're old enough to make this decision which like I say I don't think you need that time yeah yeah but and what's the counter to this then well you you just not give blockers yeah. and make someone go through the wrong puberty and then so you kind of wait to... until because they say they say your brain isn't fully developed until yeah. like mid-twenties or something yeah um, and when you're younger you're using different parts of your brain and so yeah. there are these biological things that people are using to decide at what age 
someone yeah. can make a I guess a rational decision yeah. let's say that's what they so do you think it should be it should be like that or case by case um, obviously like case it's by quite case interesting yeah to some degree because if everyone is different but if it is something you're born with you don't have a broken arm and have to see three different doctors over a period of a year before they go we'll put your arm in a cast yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. I hope that eventually but it, you can't see it it's a tough one isn't it because then the other side I guess is that you want to make sure yeah. 100% that the person wants to transition yeah. and it's not a phase they're going through yeah. or that they're going to change their minds later on I think yeah. that's probably the crux of that is it and that's what people are scared of Yeah. but as I said earlier if you know about this thing it's pretty obvious that when someone is trans that they, yeah. they're just born like that some trans people are all different don't realise until they're later but very often they tend to have problems um, psychologically and they don't know what's causing them so I know I have a very good friend that was an alcoholic and I think was a drug addict as well but didn't know there was just there was something wrong odds with the world and then as an adult realised what had been going on and is now you know sorted all the problems out transitioned and very successful with his life and happy but it was still there yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though he didn't, he hadn't realised earlier on. Yeah, yeah. So is it different in, in in like the US and Canada, age wise, or ha- is I it vary from country to country? Or Obviously, like US, you either have to pay privately or have to have your own health insurance. Oh yeah, so job. it must be a bit harder to. So it's, yeah. it's different. Yeah. Um, I don't actually know what the laws and regulations are in those countries. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then um, on the school thing, what do you think about the the, the pronoun? stuff that's very public at the moment yeah so i think they're i, mean, I can't get the i'm not going to get the countries right but i know some places they're saying you have to use uh they yeah. rather than he she mm-hmm. i think there's a union america wesleyan right where so what, what do you think about about that um i can see where the problems are arising uh, but what i would say is one of i, I spoke earlier so that i had certain coping mechanisms in place and one of them was around pronouns and stuff like that and i would kind of ration with myself and I've actually got a blog on this if anyone wants we'll to we'll stick that in the show notes details, too yeah, absolutely yeah is um if I was thirsty one time and I wanted to go into a news agents and buy a can of coke and I kind of went in and I thought well it doesn't matter whether that shop assistant says he she sir or madam I it doesn't affect how I am physically whether I was male or female it doesn't make any difference to my experience of going in and buying a can of coke so I go in buy my coke quench my thirst and I'll be happy but that was just a coping mechanism because it's not actually that simple. So the other example is if you imagine you've stubbed your toe yeah. and it's like out, 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 and you're waiting for that pain to subside. But you do that on a day when you've had a really bad day. You know, you, you, your girlfriend might have just left you. Um, your dog's just had a 700 pound vet bill coming <laughs> yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And you stub your toe. You want to crumple and just burst into tears far more easily. And that's what the trans, a transgender person's life can be like. So you've got all these problems, everything from physical, clothes, how people are treating you. There's just, it's a massive weight on your shoulders. And for someone, if you identify as male or the other way around, whichever way, and they, they call you she, that is just kicking you in the stomach and reminding you all those things. And bearing in mind... But they would do that, if they said that to you, yeah. they would be saying that to be insulting. Uh, at the moment, yes, yeah. because I passed. Yeah. But obviously, I mean, as before hormones, I kind of, I passed a lot of the time without trying, but not always. Most of the time I did. Yeah. But obviously a lot of trans people beforehand, they, they, they don't pass in their chosen gender. So there could be very various reasons. Some people do do it to, just to be me. Just to be, yeah. yeah. And some people yeah. it's because they don't know. The shop assistant wouldn't know. No. Yeah. It doesn't help that trans person to think, well, the shop assistant doesn't know that I haven't transitioned yet. It's still a reminder. Yeah. And then if you're in a company... But there's nothing you can do about that, though. I mean, no, no. the shop assistant yeah. it has free speech and is able to... Exactly. I mean, yeah. no idea. Yeah. 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 But it's just an example of how pronouns can affect someone. Yeah, yeah. So literally, yeah. if that trans person is really dysphoric on that day and they might be suicidal or self-harming and that happens, it can actually just tip them over the edge. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. something that's so little. So if you're in a company and I, I know, I look back, I've got a little great nephew who's four now and I know from at least three, he would see men or women and say he or she. It's just natural. Yeah. And it's very yeah. difficult if you see someone that's presenting or looking masculine or feminine, you just automatically would say he or she. Yeah. So if you've yeah. got someone that's about to transition, they haven't started their hormones yet, or haven't started the medical process, or don't want to, Yeah. Um, and they say, actually, can you call me she, when they look 
very masculine or vice versa it psychologically can be quite difficult and you you'll make mistakes you'll catch yourself yeah yeah Do you, it's only a word yeah. if you can i think it's important to just if you have people around you you need to let them know yeah you know please yeah. call me he she yeah exactly yeah yeah but and you know as 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 tricky as it may be if you're not used to doing that if you can use the correct pronoun their preferred pronoun yeah. you can make their day because instead of that trigger happening the opposite happens i still remember the first time i was called matt by a friend of mine and i was just i jumped up and down i was in the middle of london I was like yes yeah, someone just called me matt was it strange were you like looking around yeah. thinking huh? well no <laughs> that's what that was what was odd because one of the hardest things that i found is choosing your name you didn't never no one does that yeah yeah yeah. yeah. and you've got to live with it for the rest of your life yeah yeah and so that took a little bit of time and i just did think am i still going to respond to my old name am i gonna because you is inbuilt psychological things with words and sounds yeah yeah and you hear your name it doesn't have to be very loud and it it tweaks your interest yeah but no i just i reacted to it i'm matt and it just it felt right yeah yeah amazing yeah what do you think about another controversial thing sports topic <laughs> yeah um and so i guess for those that don't know there's there's been quite a lot in the press recently about mm. sp- s- certainly um trans females participating yeah. in female sporting events yeah um because men have more testosterone than women yeah and so the, the argument is it's unfair i mean you don't want to be in a boxing ring as a female with a trans female yeah it was a guy i think that's the yeah. the general crux yeah. of it what do you think about that and what are your your views i i'm a sporty person myself and this is close to my heart really i've i saw uh, a youtube clip with piers morgan yeah and he actually says this is a quote and we can stick this on the show me. notes too okay yeah, yeah he says um you just have to say i identify as a woman you have hormone treatment to reduce your testosterone levels to the required level, but you physically remain the same, and then you can compete in women's sport. So that's what Piers Morgan said. People have opinions, and you can argue what's right or wrong. Actually, from a technical point of view, that's not true. He's got that wrong, and that's not that's a fact. That's not disputable. So just just repeat that. In case so you missed it. He says um, if you you have hormone treatment to reduce your testosterone levels to the required level, but you physically remain the same. Hormones don't do they change you you don't remain the same so he's got that wrong so basically at the moment i think the the regulations are that you have to have continuous hormone treatment for two years and then you can compete in your required gender so by then this is the law currently um yeah i don't know if it's law but okay, that's yeah. the sporting regulations the sporting, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so if you're a trans woman so you're female which means you were born male you might have had a lot of testosterone in your system gone through a male puberty yeah but then you take oestrogen for two years, you lose muscle mass. Yeah, you know, there's certain things that are permanent, such as facial hair, so they have to have electrolysis, um, baldness and things like that, the size of your hands and your physical height and voice breaking. But muscle mass and fat redistribution change and it's hormonal. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I listened to a podcast on it as well, yeah. actually. And, and so one of, the, one, of the, one of the things they were discussing around that is that men have um, a much higher testosterone level yes. than women. Yeah. And I think even when you take oestrogen, it doesn't quite go down to the level that a female would have. Okay, I don't know about that. So I need to check on that. But I think that seems to be the crux of of their argument. And so they they felt it would be unfair, let's say in a boxing ring, if you're fighting someone who used to be Mm. male, Mm. um, because males typically are stronger and and all of that stuff. Um, I thought they did. So I don't know... You know, that's not something I'd kind of I'd looked into. But I thought that when you took oestrogen, if a trans woman takes oestrogen, that it does. Especially if they've then had surgery, so they're not producing their own testosterone. But it, even even so, when you administer the hormone, it it's like squashes your... It suppresses natural, and yeah, stuff. That's yeah, it suppresses yeah. your natural yeah. hormone. But um, I, I, I think nothing's perfect. And I do think that blockers, this is where this will come in. Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. have blockers or even... I, I think in the future we'll look back and we won't even go through the blocker stage or at least a well, short Well, science period. is advancing so quickly yeah. now that absolutely this might yeah. be a non, yeah. non-conversation very and shortly. In, in which case they won't have gone through the wrong puberty. They won't have developed that muscle mass and they, they just developed physically female or for us trans men to physically male right from the off. Yeah, yeah. Because there are different bone structures. But you know, at the end of the day as well, sports reward freaks. And I mean that, uh, so that's a positive word for a freak. Oh, no, it's so, true. Yeah, know, yeah, if you're yeah. six foot eight, 
yeah. then you might choose to be a basket player. If you're five foot, you don't. So at what point do you say, well, you're too tall, you can't be a basketball player, or your arms are too long, you can't be a swimmer. Look at Michael Phelps. He's not your typical body yeah, shape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. why he's good at swimming. Well, look, life is not fair. Exactly. It's true. Yeah. I mean, people are quicker, stronger, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's just a very interesting one. A lot of people feel it's not fair. Yeah. Um, but they don't know the full But they don't always know the full story. story also, sure. there's another... Yeah. I know um, Fallon Fox, the MMA fighter, the trans yeah. woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. There was a big article, yes. apparently, in the, in, yeah. the, in the news a few years back saying, you know, trans woman breaks, um, you know, other tr- athletes' skull. And so it, it, this is all true, because apparently this happened. <clears throat> but what they didn't... That's fighting report, for you. <laughs> exactly, yeah. What they didn't report is that apparently that's a common injury for a, a, a contact sport like MMA, that a MMA. striking yeah, sport. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I think it was the like the orbit around her around the eye socket yeah. got just like a hairline fracture or something yeah, 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 yeah. so it's quite a common injury people like to sensationalize yeah. and, exactly you know. and then what they also didn't point out apparently was that she'd lost a previous fight against a cis biological female so it wasn't a case that she's bigger and stronger and could just beat all the women do you know what I think really would need to happen with this is that someone or a group of people need to sit down and, and just put some guidelines in place. Yeah, there, there are some. And, and, and do it well, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's nothing, there's nothing's black and white and nothing's easy. Yeah, yeah. And that includes gender. Yeah. This debate about, you know, that doesn't make it easy. Binary. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't. It makes it really difficult. Yeah. Um, there isn't a 100% positive solution to it. Yeah. But yeah. I do think it's also unfair to exclude someone from sport because they're transgender you know if you're if you look at the the regulations around um disability and wheelchair users uh, i had someone recently say to me why why should we put toilet gender neutral toilets in just for a few people and you know they, they thought that was okay to say that but you wouldn't say that for a wheelchair user you know no. there's not many wheelchair users compared to non-wheelchair users and yet there's laws i know not necessarily for built existing buildings but for new builds they all have to have certain things to make them accessible yeah no no definitely we need to practice tolerance more. Yes. <laughs> and just accept, learn and listen. Yeah, or acceptance. You know, you know, I mean, yeah, people, everyone's different. Yeah. You just have to relax, accept it. Yeah. It doesn't affect your life. And the world would be boring if we were all the same. The wor- Yeah. <laughs> Where people accept people's differences, the world would be a much less violent and war-torn place, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. yeah. No, interesting. Um, well, look, great to speak to you. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, I'm looking forward to attending your event at Dive In Festival, mm-hmm. which is uh, on the 24th yep. of September. Yeah. So looking forward to that. How can people get in touch with you if they want to engage you for talking and all of that kind of stuff? Um, you can find me at mattsellison.co.uk. Okay, cool. Um, there's contact details on there, including for booking. Great. Um, and in terms of the diving festival, say so that's next, it's Tuesday, the 24th yeah. of September. And I'm speaking in Chatham, but there's loads of events. It is such an amazing festival to be taking place. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. It's really, it's really awesome. They've done so many, they're doing a lot of great stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's really cool for us to be involved with it as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, look, well done in getting involved. And we'll put it in the show notes as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places.